Hi everyone. Happy New Year. Welcome to 2023 and our 13th, lucky 13, uh, Facebook Live session. Welcome. We have a lot of ground to cover this evening and um, thank you again for joining and thank you again for being part of making 2022 successful together. So um, in addition to Musk Twitter, a lot of you have asked me to cover two other areas. One is Trump and his tax returns and the other is George Santos out on Long Island who is set to be sworn in tomorrow. Uh, and I just thought as an interesting prelude to doing so tonight, I would mention the similarity of the three. And that is all three of these men, Elon Musk, Donald Trump, and George Santos, all present themselves to be a certain thing and turn out to be another. In other words, they create a story, they create a myth about themselves. The difference between Trump and Musk is they were both born extremely wealthy as billionaires. So they had the money to paper over the fact that maybe they didn't go to college where they said they went to college. Uh, maybe the art of the deal was really being born a billionaire and actually losing a good portion of that each year. Maybe if you're Musk, uh, being born a billionaire allows you to also hide your education and, and be able to buy Series A in Tesla and take over a company and make it your idea. It allows you to be an investor in SpaceX and put people in place that allow you to look like the smart guy until the Emperor Has No Clothes, which was our discussion last week. And then this time we're also going to talk about George Santos, who similarly has created this myth about himself, for lack of a better word, and that is likewise unfolding. But unlike the other two, he doesn't have the billions of dollars in the army of people to hide it. So it comes out in plain sight more quickly. So we're going to discuss all three, but we have a lot of ground to cover on Musk Twitter as we get into 2023. And some of this is going to be sort of a synopsis of things we've discussed in the first 12 sessions, which are now also on YouTube. Uh, the last two sessions had over 110,000 views, so thank you all for watching and sharing it. So let's start off with something that we discussed in the first few Facebook Live sessions, which was the idea that it would be two things that could possibly take Musk Twitter down. Um, and those two things were financial and technology, remember? And mostly since then, we've been talking about technology, although we talked about, excuse me, about financial, although we mentioned with technology, the warning signs of all the engineers who are being fired, uh, and just in, in some, just to put a metric on it, three quarters of Twitter employees today where we sit have been fired or resigned. This company is down to under 2,000 employees from 7,500. The engineers that left warned us that it wouldn't be like an overnight, you know, just everything breaking down, but that gradually things would degrade. Uh, there, was, there was a massive hack last week that was reported, but as well, there was, in, the Twitter actually went down in some places last week, which is a major occurrence. And the reason may have been, there's three data centers that Twitter has, and uh, in his cost-cutting efforts, which we're gonna discuss tonight at length, Musk decided to shut down the Sacramento data center. So we don't know if that is what it was to blame on, Tuesday, on last Wednesday, but for many people who went to go log on to their Twitter account around the world last Wednesday, uh, they were not able to get in, or they had other malfunctions that occurred. So again, that's something we're gonna keep an eye on. You know, the, the degrading of these systems, you've closed one of three data centers, what happens in, the, in a surge, or this might have been a software update, uh, but you don't have the engineers. You can only borrow the Tesla and the SpaceX engineers for so long. Um, it is not a company strategy to not have employees. Although you know, Musk seems to think it is, but that's not a strategy. Um, so, the other way that this company and what we've talked about so far could go away or be bankrupt or need to be sold is the financial side. And I wanna start off here by saying tonight is Sunday. Two weeks ago Sunday, we had a conversation. 
you'll recall. And that conversation was because Musk had put up a poll on his page saying, should I resign? And I told you that night he was going to have to resign. It wasn't just a poll as any of the polls had been to actually want your input. It was because Tesla stock was tanking and he was getting pressure to step away from Twitter because Tesla was going. So two weeks ago, he did the poll. Then he said, eh, you know, it was just a poll. And maybe next time I do the polls, only paid subscribers will be part of it. It's not really a poll. But then the pressure kept building. And within a couple of days, he said, okay, I'm gonna step down. So that's now two weeks ago. And so part of what we've been talking about in our whole Emperor Has No Clothes discussion is succession planning. If you ran a restaurant, if you ran a coffee shop, if you ran a multi-billion dollar company and you were preparing to resign, what is the first thing you have to do? Have your replacement. That's how it works. And as I said, in our last few sessions, no one that is any good is going to want to take this job because essentially you're a puppet regime. Uh, you know, you're, you're like, you know, you're in there, but you re completely report to Musk and he has 101% say in anything that happens. You're also inheriting a mess and a company close to bankruptcy. So who is going to step in on that? Well, as we've seen here, we are two weeks in, no one seems too eager to step into that. So again, why is Musk stepping down? Well, we've been talking about this gradually. Let's start off with where we were the last couple of sessions. This is Musk's net worth. He started 2000, excuse me, I have to get used to this being backwards. He started 2022 with about 304 billion. When we did our Facebook Live a week ago, it was down to 148 billion. Then we did another Facebook Live, it was down to 139 billion. Well, guess what folks? Tesla stock kept going down. So as we close out 2022, Elon Musk has made history. He is the first person in the history of this world to lose $200 billion in net worth in a little over a year. His net worth peaked November, 2021 at 340 billion. He is now worth, according to Bloomberg, 137 billion. At one point, Twitter, excuse me, Tesla had a little rally towards the end of the year, a little rally. He was down to 132 billion. He has lost more than half his net worth. And the vast majority of that loss came after what? After he took over Twitter. And it's not just the emperor has no clothes. Okay, that's a big part of it. There are analysts now who are saying that Tesla could trade down to 50 next year, or this year, I should say. Part of it is the emperor has no clothes. He's shown himself to not be a visionary, but just like a juvenile control freak autocrat. Um, and then, you know, part of it is concerns about other parts of what Tesla faces. But as you'll recall, the vast majority of his personal wealth is tied up in Tesla stock. And as we mentioned last time, he's been selling Tesla stock as sort of a piggy bank to fund Twitter and try to keep it alive. But what happens is as the price goes down of Tesla stock, Tesla has now during 2022 lost two thirds of its value, almost all of it since he took over Twitter. But what happens when, you, when, you, um, when the value goes down, his ability to essentially borrow against his shares has diminished immensely. In other words, the lower the stock price, the more shares you need to pledge as collateral to borrow. So as we talked about last time, according to the Wall Street Journal, he was down to only about 13 billion of available borrowing from Tesla shares. Now, if it goes down further, if it goes down to $50 a share, he is in trouble. You're going to start to see him have to sell SpaceX. This guy, I'm sure, has huge living expenses the way he lives, despite what he does, the cruel way he's treated even the janitors at Tesla uh, and firing them and not paying them. But this guy has a, you know, he has his jet. He has his, you know, life of extraordinary privilege. He has a personal high operating cost to live his life. 
and his lack of availability to use Tesla as a piggy bank is, is going to impact significantly what happens to him and Tesla coming into 2023. But here we are two weeks in and no new CEO. Let's talk about another data point that we know. We've talked about the banks. We've talked about the fact that there are 13 billion of bank loans outstanding. Some of it is structured as bank loans. A smaller portion is structured as bonds. Some of those are unsecured. And we know we've talked about the fact that the banks are writing those down at the end of the year. They're writing down the senior tranches reportedly to 80 to 90 cents on the dollar. We've talked about the fact that they are writing down the lower tranches to perhaps 50 cents on the dollar. The New York Times also is reporting that they have been bid, these seven banks, at a discount. And as we've talked about extensively, this 13 billion of bank debt has to get paid out in whole before any of the equity investors that are along with Musk see a penny. So for example, if this company is worth 15 billion, the first 13 billion goes to the banks and then the 2 billion has to be split with Elon and all his other investors, which are roughly, as we talked about, 33.5 billion. Okay, so another interesting data point, we've been hearing the news about the banks. It was disclosed this week by Axios, Fidelity. Some of you might invest in the Fidelity Contra Fund or other Fidelities funds. They had an investment, excuse me, my, my kids are not home tonight to play uh, guard with Arlene. So if, I'm gonna have to yell at her now and then. Arlene, stop. Okay, such authority. Um, so Fidelity holds, they don't call it Twitter, they call it some sort of X, investment X. As of October 30th, they valued an Encontra fund at, at 53.5. As of November 30th, they had written it down by 56%. Musk took over October 26. So in his first month of ownership, they had written it down in half. We don't know where it is December 31st, but I can tell you it's going to be lower. What this tells you is, what does Fidelity know as somebody on the inside? A company that was purchased for 44 billion, we've been talking about at the time of closing, it was worth about half that. Now it is worth significantly less. Is it worth 10 billion? That means the banks are gonna lose money. Is it worth 15 billion? That means there's almost no money for the equity. But here's another data point, and we'll watch to see where they write it down on December 31st, if Twitter makes it that long. Uh, this is another data point to indicate that this company is declining in value rapidly. So, Back to our two ways, okay? So we talked about finance and technology. Now, with finance, what were the three red flags we talked about? We talked about, number one, not paying your vendors. Okay, there was an article in the New York Times, if you haven't read it, it blew my socks off. Like We knew he wasn't paying rent, but he's also not allowing employees to spend a cent. So employees are literally bringing in their own toilet paper to work. He's fired or he's, he's, he won't pay the janitors what they've asked. So there's no janitorial help at any of these offices. So any of you who have either worked at a company or alternatively, if you've just been in a, say an airport bathroom or a bus terminal bathroom that hasn't been cleaned in a week or a day, what's that like? Imagine going to work at Twitter San Francisco. Uh, you had six floors originally, now you're on two floors. Uh, people are ordering food because they have to work late hours. People are bringing their own toilet paper. The bathrooms are not being cleaned. People are working extra hours and according to the New York Times, smelling each other's body odor because you know, the offices aren't being cleaned and it's just filthy and there's food in these places, okay? So that's like the lay of the land of what it's like to work in these offices. In San Francisco, we also know since we spoke in the beginning, he shut the Brussels office, which was sort of the, where, the place that the regulators care about in the EU. We learned this last week that he's about to be evicted from the Seattle office, uh, and that's about to be shuttered, Twitter Seattle. 
We know he hasn't paid the rent either for New York and San Francisco Twitter offices. And we know that he was given a warning as of December 13th and a time to cure non-payment in San Francisco. He did not pay that. And as of last Thursday, he was given five days to either pay the rent in San Francisco or be evicted from basically the Twitter headquarters. Arlene, no. So, okay, you're not paying. And it's not a huge amount of money that he's not paying in San Francisco. It's roughly $130,000. So let alone, how much did we talk? We said the bank debt was 13 billion. The interest expense, depending on which reporting you listen to, is either somewhere between 1 billion and 1.2 billion. So he is paying 100 million of interest expense each month. He's paying that, but he can't pay $130,000 of, of rent. And there's another lawsuit that was filed against him last week by a corporate jet company in New Hampshire that um, had Twitter employees in October before his deal closed use a corporate jet and he owes them $200,000 and he's also not paying. So now you've got litigation for non-payment. He's told his employees not to pay vendors to try to negotiate it down. Uh, he's not paying Deloitte. He finally did pay KPMG, but KPMG was responsible for something related to another red flag which is the regulatory concern. And we've been talking extensively about the FTC and this consent decree that was signed by Twitter in 2011. And even though it predates Musk, the company must comply with it. And KPMG was doing part of the work to you know, provide the information that it was in compliance. He wasn't paying KPMG. Apparently he just paid them what he was due. It's unclear if he'll pay them going forward, but as alarmingly, this is the second red flag, um, the FTC two weeks ago, we talked about, had sent a letter to Musk saying, do you plan to comply with our consent decree? We know that when the quarter end came, that rather than sign off that they were in compliance, all the employees responsible for that resigned. So that's kind of hanging over his head, the FTC, he's got that. He's got the Treasury Department. Remember, we've talked about with Janet Yellen and an investigation. She didn't deny this investigation is ongoing as to who the other equity holders are. We talked about, we've had, now we can add fidelity to our list, but we got a lot of information from the Washington Post that we talked about last time about who owns this equity. We know for sure that a Saudi prince, we know for sure this was new information that a Qatar sovereign fund is involved. Uh, so we had six out of the seven billion, and now we know that Fidelity is also part of that. But who else is part of that? We don't know. And that's also an under, under investigation. And also the European Union. Uh, again, he closed the office in Brussels, which is sort of the, you know, the line into the regulatory part of what needs to be done for the EU. That was Shudder too. So he's, uh, you know, under in, investigation, not investigation is not the right word, but um, the EU and by country, we knew in Germany and in France, the government regulatory groups have reached out to him to ask if he's going to abide by their rules relating to privacy and moderation of content. Okay, so what was the other uh, red flags? We know he's not paying his vendors. And when you don't pay your vendors, what is that the sign of? You don't have cash, right? You know, we've already talked about the fact that he's probably in def on covenant default, definitely, on his bank loans. Um, if he goes into default by not paying those interest payments, again, roughly a hundred million a month, uh, then he can be put into bankruptcy by the banks without him putting it in. And then the third was, remember, we've talked about how this company makes money and the revenue base was about 90% of it was ad revenue. As he took control of this company, the run rate of revenue was about 4.8 billion a year. Let me pull this back out. It's about 4.8 billion a year. And then as we talked about last week, the Wall Street Journal reported 
89% of that, again, so about 4.3 billion of the 4.8 of revenue came from ads. 70% of the top 100 advertisers as of the end of December were no longer advertising on Twitter. So that means you lost, even if we're generous and say, well, some of the smaller ones might still be at least half of its revenue, advertising revenue. So the third red flag was, you know, Musk's big answer to that was, well, no problem. We're going to have a massive amount of subscriptions. They're going to be sold for $8 on uh, Facebook, excuse me, on Twitter, and then on Apple and Google Play for $11. And remember, we expressed the concern that at some point, just like has happened with Trump Social at various points and with Parler, that when the moderation wasn't happening, they were basically kicked out of the Apple Store. Well, one thing that I've been watching is the Apple Store is still not allowing these subscriptions to be sold. And we haven't heard anything from Musk about bragging about how many subscriptions they have. So you can bet that they're teeny tiny. Even if you did 100,000, that's $96 a subscription per year, $8 a month times 12, times 100,000. That is nothing, nothing. So where are we headed into this year as we start 2023? Uh, he's still tweeting. The stock market's not gonna open tomorrow, but the day after, you're gonna see what happens to Tesla. Uh, a large number of, um, uh, uh, corp more like, you know, large in institutional investors have abandoned the company. The people that are largely buying now are individuals, you know, who believe they are getting a real bargain. We'll, we'll see if that's the case. But a lot of institutions have just given up. You know, the Tesla board is his brother and other loyalists, and they don't seem to be able to get through to him to say, stop the madness. If he were a rational player, he would have already either sold Twitter or filed it in bankruptcy, as we discussed, because he has lost far more money in Tesla stock than he would lose in his Twitter investment. Remember, <laughs> that's where we started today. His net worth has gone from, you know, in the beginning of the year, 304 billion, in the beginning of the year to 137 billion. Almost all of that you know, all of it is a decline in Tesla value. So I believe the pressure will continue. You know, everyone's sort of taking a breather for the holiday. He's going to come back in addition to all the other things that he's been facing with the banks, with non-payment now being sued and potentially kicked out of his office in San Francisco, in New York, uh, being sued by this corporate jet company, potentially being sued by former employees, these mass uh, lawsuits that are coming his way for possible discrimination against women and people with disabilities, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, he's trying to quiet employees and pick out and, and target people that are speaking to the media. What does that sound like, an autocrat? But all of this stuff is kind of coming to an end. And uh, because he can't keep selling Tesla shares, to you know, use as a piggy bank to finance Twitter, and because no one with half a brain would give any more money to this company in the form of equity, it is a you know slow march to either bankruptcy or sale. And again, we know the banks are being bid at a discount. The banks might at some point just sell at 60 cents on the dollar, and then you're gonna have someone aggressive owning that debt who is going to go in and play hardball with him. Uh, or if that doesn't happen, you, you're going to have right now, I assure you Musk is getting bids for the company and I assure you it is under 20 billion, possibly under 15 billion, and it's going to either be a complete write-off for the equity holders or very close to it. But these things are all going to come to a head. There is no upside here. You know, it, it would be great for every corporation and every stock in the, in, the, in the world if you didn't have to have employees and you didn't have to pay your rent. Just think of all the money you could save. You know, it's just the most absurd thing. It's like, oh, I run a restaurant. What if I didn't have any waiters or cooks? And what if I didn't pay the rent for my restaurant? I would make so much more money. Great. Well, guess what, folks? That's not how it works. You need employees to run your company. 
You need to pay your rent. You need to pay your vendors. You need to pay, pay the people that prepare your taxes, <laughs> etc. cetera. Um, so this company is coming to an implosion. At, you know, the only question is at what point do we start to see Tesla? We, you know, we talked about Tesla's lost two thirds of its value. Does that continue to create or does that put additional pressure on him? Regardless, even if Tesla recovered so much, the pressure is going to remain on him in the short term to do something. So I'm going to quickly talk about Trump's taxes and George Santos, and then I'm going to take questions, uh, save your questions. I'll be watching them back to Twitter and Musk and answer your questions. So quickly on Trump taxes, okay, sort of the tip of the waves uh, that we know so far. The things that are, are broadly of concern are um, that Trump's taxes were not audited for four of the years that they should have been audited, which is not normal. It wasn't until these taxes possibly were going to be released that his last year in office, those tax return for 2020 was audited. But 2016, 17, 18, and 19, which would be normal for a president in office to have the IRS audit them, were not audited. So Trump's numbers, as you know, again, we talked about with Musk, you know, this great businessman lost tens of billions of dollars, according to him, that he was taking these huge write-offs that were essentially, this man has paid no taxes, paid precisely zero taxes in 2020, paid almost no taxes in 2016 and 17, and paid a small amount in 2018 and 19, minor. But his whole rationale for not paying taxes is, again, these huge write-offs. We know Tish James, the New York Attorney General, is investigating that and, is, and, uh, you know, and, and has said publicly that this is bogus and there's all sorts of tricks there. But the key takeaway is tax returns from 2016 through 19 are still being audited. So there could be liability for him there. I don't know what the IRS would do if they find that he had vastly underpaid taxes. It might just trigger that he has to then pay the taxes um, and more likely than the criminal or the civil charges. The, the civil charges would be from Tish James uh, in New York and her, her uh, push to have Trump and his children no longer be able to do business in the state of New York. That is ongoing. She also made a criminal referral to the Manhattan DA. So that is all related to his taxes and his mischaracterization, according to what they're finding, of vastly overstating uh, and, and you know, stating different numbers if you were reporting your taxes versus an appraisal to get a loan. So all of that is ongoing. The other red flag that people have raised is this bank account in China. So uh, in the first couple of years in office, Trump had three foreign bank accounts. You would expect Saudi Arabia and Qatar, but no. But one of the three was China, and then it was shut down. But if you'll recall from my weekly list in my work, that all of a sudden, it was the strangest thing when Trump took office, Ivanka's companies got all of these like trademark releases to be able to do business in China. Just the strangest thing, all of a sudden. Uh, and Trump's businesses, all of a sudden, you know, wow, we're able to do business in China. And he had an account there, which is really odd because you tend to have an account in China if you need to use their currency. And Trump, at that point, you know, to our knowledge, didn't have any businesses there. So that's a big, you know, question mark to be investigated. So, you know, where we sit today, we don't, you know, there's not, there's no big, like, uh, other than that, and, and the numbers not being audited, there's no big silver bullet that I've seen so far. But stay tuned. And I think the bigger thing that is going to bring him down, uh, you know, in terms of criminal matters, is there are the special counsel that is, you know, very quietly working away on possible indictments, either related to January 6th, please, and or the confidential information that was brought to Mar-a-Lago. So stay tuned for that. Um, just one final note on Trump. I wrote this in my Facebook post today. He's done with politics, folks. 
if you are worried about that at all, I please, this is, I, this is something I take very seriously. I, I devoted four and a half years of my life to documenting him. He is done politically. The Republican Party lost three races because of him. They are not coming back for a fourth one. They have learned their lesson. He is losing support within his party. Um, at this point, the only question in my mind is whether there are consequences. Uh, and a lot of us would like consequences beyond financial consequences. We would like him to serve jail time, especially for the attempted coup of our government. So that to me is the only question mark. It, you know, we'll see what the special counsel comes up with. Stay tuned. Okay. And now George Santos, the third person who created this myth, just like Elon Musk and Donald Trump, that guess what? Turns out not to be true. It does look like he will be sworn in tomorrow. Okay. But that's not going to be the end of the story. And, you know, I know a little bit about this. Okay. Just very quick background. I live in an area close to Long Island where this election happened. And when the lines were originally drawn, this was actually going to be my district. Uh, where I live was going to be part of, with Northern Long Island, a, a congressional district. And then in August, New York got totally redrawn, which is in part how this fell through the cracks. Uh, because no one looked in, in, into this until August to really look closely at this guy, Santos. Uh, I knocked doors for Robert Zimmerman. Uh, he, I was fully behind him on Long Island, for, you know, four times, four different weekends heading up to the election. And um, people didn't even really know Santos. I, I, I mean, from my experience, and I, after I knocked doors, I reached out and found Hochul's campaign manager and said to her, him, you are going to lose this race unless you get your act together. Because I would knock doorbells and they're like, eh, you know, we're lifelong Democrats, but either because of Biden or Hochul, we are not voting for the Democrat. We don't even know this guy, Santos. We don't particularly like him, but we're just not voting for the Democrat. So you could kind of see this was coming, uh, unfortunately. And um, New York, as you've read in the press, was a mess. So um, he's going to be sworn in, but there are three ongoing investigations. So that is not the end of the story. And even the Republican, who will be the incoming chair of the House Oversight Committee, has said it's likely that they will, uh, the House Oversight Committee, run an investigation of him. But there's three other investigations. Letitia James, again, the New York Attorney General, is examining his conduct. The Nassau Attorney General uh, is also examining, examining you know, at, at, at the local level what he said and his lies. But the big case seems to be a federal case, which is looking at his financials. Um, and those financials, when he ran for office or tried to run for office in 2020, his income was $55,000 and he had zero of assets. That was what he declared. In 2022, suddenly he had assets of somewhere between roughly three to 11 million out of nowhere. And he loaned his campaign over $700,000. So how did you get from A to B, from zero in assets to over three million of assets when you didn't even have like, a, you know, these jobs he largely were all lies. Uh, and then during the campaign, he also paid out $11,000 of rent for a house where he lived, which is illegal, uh, paid for $40,000 of flights. Like you, you're running in Long Island. You have to like fly from uh, Queens to Long Island in your district. I mean, he was flying all over, hotel bills all over. This guy's a mess, um, but he doesn't have the cleaner uppers that Trump and Musk have to make it all go away. So he's gonna take office, but the story is not over. And uh, you can even see the Republicans starting to kind of turn against him too. Um, I don't know what will happen if he is found criminally or civilly uh, you know, indicted. I don't know if that will mean another election. We will have to wait and see. So with that, we've now covered the, the three for tonight, but I'd like to go back to Twitter and Musk, which is you know, the majority of what we've discussed in these and take your questions. So if you have questions about anything we've discussed, um, and I'll try to go back and look at some of the older ones, but if you could just write them again, I think that would be the most helpful. If you have any questions about 
uh, about Twitter, you know, just uh, put them in now if we can. Questions about Musk, Twitter, about their finances. And, and I just want to address, I, I've addressed this a couple of times. Um, some people say, oh, Musk bought this company just to destroy it. And that is not the case. And Twitter is not going away. If this company goes bankrupt or is sold, new management, Twitter will exist. It just won't be Musk Twitter. Musk made a bid for this company when he was worth considerably more than he is now. He had money jiggling in his pocket. He had an ego trip one day and just made a bid for this company. He was forced to close, even though it was worth half of what he paid for it. None of this was to, you know, for anything other than ego and being a bad manager. Twitter will still exist. And I, and I just want to say, I, I mentioned this as well on my um, post on my Facebook page. I have to say, I am someone who was much more active on Twitter than Facebook prior to Musk taking over. Once he came, I stopped tweeting. But not only like the quality of my life is so much better, but I noticed as a country, what Twitter had devolved into was basically tweeting crap at each other. And I had a huge following. I had close to 600,000 followers there. And the things that got the most likes and the most retweets and therefore the most the behavior that was most encouraged and is, is like subtweeting Ted Cruz or subtweeting, you know, whatever, Elon Musk or somebody who's on the other side, calling them out on hypocrisy, calling them out and creating this sort of, you know, arguments online. And the other way, you know, the people on the far right doing it to AOC or to Greta Thunberg or whatever, you know, that was, that's basically what Twitter, even before he took over, had devolved to. Those were the tweets that were getting the most traffic. So, yeah, for good or bad, maybe for good for now, the fact that Twitter is becoming less relevant, I think is better for us in coming more civil, um, you know, and, and, and rewarding this ongoing fighting. Like, I mean, I, it's just, it doesn't help anyone. All it does is sort of raise the stars. Oh, AOC tweeted at so-and-so. Like, that doesn't make our country better. That doesn't dial down the volume. That doesn't accomplish anything. It's just like, you know, a, gla a gladiator match. And that's what Twitter has become, you know, in addition to the news. But the news became, you know, people didn't really care about the news. They, they came for the fights. You know, the, they want to see the fights. Um, okay, so I'm going to go down and check for questions if we have them on Twitter. I was wondering how Musk's worth continue to go down while the stock is back up to 123 from a low of 129. So um, when, I, I think I mentioned this, but at, at the end of the year, according to Bloomberg, the value, his net worth is 137. To answer your question, at one point it was as low as 132. And that is the difference because Twitter had closed lower for a day or two uh, and then rebounded a little before the end of the year. But the value, um, how Elon's net worth comes about. Thought I had this. He's got, here it is. Uh, no, I don't have it. Um, his net worth is basically two components. It's Tesla shares. Uh, he has Tesla options and 424 million shares that he owns. And then he has a 40% holding in SpaceX. SpaceX on paper is worth 125 billion. So on paper, again, unlike uh, Tesla, which is a public company, which trades on the stock market, SpaceX is a private company, but on paper it is worth 125 billion. His 40% stake is worth 50 billion. So anything above 50 billion, basically his net worth is just these two things, um, and Twitter, which is, you know, as we now know, worth about nothing. Uh, okay, if Twitter is sold, how would Musk still control it? He won't. If it's sold. Uh, that means somebody else will control it and um, he will be, you know, if it's sold for above 13 billion, he and the other equity holders, if it's sold above 13 billion, remember the first 
13 billion goes to the banks. So if it's sold for lower than 13 billion, the banks take a haircut, the equity gets zero. If it's sold for above 13 billion, the 13 billion is split between the 33.5 billion. Remember, we, we did an example last time that if the company is sold for 15 billion, there would be 2 billion to be split between the 33.5 billion. And you can take out your calculators, for those of you nerds like me, 2 billion divided by 33.5, they would get back 6 cents on the dollar. Twitter has devolved to the cult of mediocrity. I, you know, I, I counted on Twitter during the weekly list to um, keep me up on the news, but yes, it degraded once the news cycle became more normal and there wasn't, you know, breaking news. So-and-so is being arrested and marched out of their house. Uh, and it just became like a hate chamber. Okay. Are there security risks posed by SpaceX interacting with NASA, et cetera? I, I know that we talked about um, a couple of times ago that the head of SpaceX, I can't remember her name right now, but she was contacted by NASA. They were concerned about Musk's behavior and um, its impact on SpaceX. From now, what has been reported, that seems to be like, you know, anyone who has worked at SpaceX seems to say they kind of just ring fence off and for lack of a better word, manage Musk even before this. So I, I think what they're trying to tell the NASA is, you know, he's doing his thing and we still are doing our thing. Um, the troubling aspect for both Tesla and SpaceX is they have uh, been forced unilaterally to um, have their engineers move over to Twitter. <laughs> and they are being charged. Those bills, they're going to pay. <laughs> they're being charged. Uh, and Twitter is paying Tesla and paying uh, SpaceX for loan of those engineers. So the, as you can tell, folks, this is not a, a plan of longevity. And this man did not have any grand vision for Twitter. This is just, you know, March to uh, the end. So um, I'll take one more question. If you have a question, just write it as a comment and then we will call it a night. <laughs> uh, does anyone else have a question related to what we're talking about? Not the rest of my other posts. Okay, folks, so um, I may have missed it, but you spoke about, but I'm wondering what you think the future of Tesla is. Yet he is vulnerable to foreign influence. I mean, but he's always been. So uh, I'm not a expert on, on Tesla or the stock. I, I, I Personally, I would not buy it or sell it. If we're not, I mean, I would sell it short. I wouldn't buy it if you're not already involved. I would watch it for a while. This is going, you know, there's, $17 billion was created in value by people who shorted the stock while retail investors are buying it, which, you know, not that we're not always smart. Listen, I bought Facebook when it was trading at $10 when everyone else was selling it. Uh, you know, so there are opportunities to buy things cheaply, but Musk is a risk. And then away from that, there's all sorts of other risks for competition, um, you know, that GM and Ford and all the others you know, and, and this company is having problems. Um, he pushed out a CEO of Twitter. We, we, he resigned two weeks ago. It's not that he can't be pushed out. He's resigned. This is just bad management. He's no succession planning. Um, there's nobody that wants this job. Would you want to take this job of a company about to go bankrupt when Elon Musk is going to you know, scream at you no matter what you do? <laughs> what fool would take this job? Oh, and by the way, he doesn't pay people. <laughs> oh, <laughs> sounds so good to be true. Um, yeah, that's a question. If, if Tesla's a car company, which some people now say it is, it's going to trade at $25. It's going to trade at the same multiple as Ford and, and GM, as opposed to being tr tr trading as a technology company, which is what he's done. Um, the Morgan Stanley analyst said Tesla will rebound in its value. I wonder if that assessment is... Morgan Stanley changed their valuation, so you might want to change that. They, uh, at the end of the year, I think backed off on their valuation and have lowered it. Okay, everyone. 
Thank you. And um, we will be back as things develop. Other than that, uh, if you missed this and you're watching it on replay, uh, which most people seem to do, uh, feel free to leave a question as a comment and I will um, answer them that way. Feel free to share this. Um, what will happen if Twitter is booted out of their San Francisco office? I guess we're going to find out this week. <laughs> I guess we're going to find out. I guess everyone's going to work from home. <laughs> I don't know. This is like the worst run company. This, I guarantee you, this will be a Harvard Business School study of everything to do wrong with running a company. He has only been in this company for two months and he has completely destroyed it. So with that, good night. And uh, here's to 2023. Good night, everyone.